In this lecture, we'll discuss a variety of sexual disorders, as well as homosexuality, which is no longer considered a disorder. Some of these disorders are some of the hardest to truly define because normal versus abnormal sexual behavior can differ over time or by culture. For instance, how premature does a man's ejaculation need to be before it's actually premature ejaculation? Or how infrequent does a woman's orgasm need to be to be classified as female orgasmic disorder? Thus, it's particularly important to pay attention to whether or not the disorder causes harm to other people or violates their rights or whether it causes significant distress or impairment in functioning. At least one of those must be present for all of these diagnoses. We'll first discuss how sexuality, including homosexuality, was understood throughout history. Then we'll talk about the diagnosis of gender dysphoria, followed by paraphilias and sexual dysfunctions. Around the 1970s was also when society's perception of homosexuality began changing. Prior to 1973, homosexuality was included in the DSM as a mental illness in need of treatment. It was removed in the third edition of the DSM once evidence suggested that homosexuality was compatible with psychological normality. However, it is important to note that people who are homosexual tend to disproportionately be at higher risk of experiencing various mental health illnesses compared to heterosexual individuals. But this likely occurs through added stress and discrimination, not due to homosexuality itself. The homosexuality was no longer considered a mental illness in the 1970s. It wasn't until 2003 that the Supreme Court finally established a law for sexual privacy, striking down a Texas law banning sexual behavior between two people of the same sex. With regard to gender, we know that homosexuality is more likely to occur in men. The exact causes of homosexuality are unclear, though evidence suggests that it is at least partially, if not entirely, biologically determined rather than environmentally determined or by choice. Our best hypothesis for understanding why some people are homosexual is that it has something to do with the level of sex hormones the individual was exposed to while in utero. Specifically, that gay men were likely exposed to higher than normal levels of female sex hormones and that gay women were likely exposed to higher than normal level of male sex hormones. There's a lot of research and anecdotal evidence supporting that homosexuality is biological in nature. First, concordance rates of homosexuality are higher among identical versus fraternal twins. This indicates some genetic component. Next, studies have shown that the more biological older brothers a man has, the greater his chance of being homosexual. It's thought that this is due to a maternal immune response to male fetuses that gets stronger after every pregnancy with a male and this can disrupt brain masculinization in utero. Next, people who are homosexual are more likely to be left-handed than right-handed. Since handedness is biologically determined and it's related to sexual preference, this is evidence for a biological determinant to homosexuality as well. Similarly, there are differences in finger size. Heterosexual men and masculine lesbians tend to have longer fourth fingers than index fingers while gay men and heterosexual women show either no differences or have a longer index finger. So if this is something that you're interested in looking at, you can't just look at which looks longer since fingers don't have all of the same starting positions. Instead, you actually need to measure the length of the fingers. So again, since our finger size is biologically determined and is related to sexual preference, it's likely that sexual preference is also biological. Finally, there are also brain differences in the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus regulates motivated behavior, or behavior we engage in to keep alive or to sustain our genes. We must engage in sex to procreate, thereby continuing our gene pool. So sexual behavior is regulated by the hypothalamus. Homosexual men show clear differences in their hypothalamus compared to heterosexual men, and in fact, show more similarities to the hypothalamus of heterosexual women. As an argument against the choice theory of homosexuality, anecdotally, many homosexual adults report that they recall engaging in many sex atypical behaviors as a child. For example, homosexual men may recall playing with dolls or Barbie much more than most heterosexual men. 
This indicates that these guys don't grow up like a typical heterosexual individual and then one day just decide to be gay. It instead indicates that their sexual preference is something that has its roots very early in life, likely in development. Based on these anecdotes, though, some people may argue that environmental factors must influence sexual preference. For example, people become gay because their parents permitted them or encouraged them to engage in sex atypical behavior in childhood. However, strong evidence against that comes from case studies of individuals in Melanesia. This culture believes in semen conservation because they believe that it takes many inseminations and a lot of semen in order to eventually impregnate a woman. Thus, they start engaging in semen storage early in life. Young males practice semen exchange with each other by way of oral sex. The younger boys will ingest the semen from the adolescent males. After puberty, the younger males switch roles and start supplying some of their semen to younger boys, now that they have a sufficient store of semen. If the way in which one was raised contributed to the development of homosexuality, then we surely would expect the majority of these boys to be homosexual as adults given that they frequently engage in homosexual behaviors as children. However, most boys easily transition and stop engaging in homosexual acts as adults and do not consider themselves to be homosexual. The first disorder we will discuss is gender dysphoria, specifically for children. This disorder is characterized by an incongruence as well as psychological distress and dissatisfaction with the gender one has been assigned with at birth. Thus, it is not sexual, but rather a disturbance in the person's sense of being a male or female. It is associated with at least six of the following symptoms. One symptom that must be present is the strong desire to be the other gender or insistence that one is the other gender. In addition, they have a strong preference for wearing clothing typical of the opposite gender or are defiant when they are forced to wear gender, gender typical clothing. This could look like a little boy who is forced to wear jeans and a shirt rather than a dress that he wanted to wear. Relatedly, they have a strong preference for cross-gender roles in make-believe play, and they prefer games, toys, or activities that are stereotypically used by the other gender, and they often reject these gender-typical toys, games, or activities. An individual expressed a strong dislike of their own sexual anatomy, and instead, they have a strong desire for the primary and or secondary sex characteristics of their experienced gender is another symptom. These symptoms must last at least six months and cause significant distress or impairment in functioning. It is important to note that there is no longer a diagnosis of gender identity disorder because simply having the experience that one's gender is inconsistent with biological sex is not a mental illness. However, when that occurs in the context of distress or impairment, which is essentially dysphoria, then it is a disorder. In addition, gender dysphoria can also occur with disorders of sex development which was formerly known as intersexuality. This occurs when someone is born with ambiguous genitalia and associated with documented hormonal or other physical abnormalities. This must be specified if it occurs, but it is not necessary for a gender dysphoria diagnosis. In adolescents and adults, many fewer symptoms are needed. This is because it's assumed that adolescents and adults have a better understanding of their preferences and can also verbalize their stated desires, whereas children can't. Thus, children must experience many of the symptoms in order for it to be diagnostic evidence for gender dysphoria. But in adolescents and adults, only two symptoms are needed. First, there's an incongruence between the gender that the individual feels they are and their primary or secondary sex characteristics. So an individual who states that they are a woman may have a penis and facial hair. Next, there is a stated strong desire to rid of one's sex characteristics because of this incongruence. Relatedly, they wish to have the sex characteristics typical of the opposite gender. They state a strong desire to be the opposite gender and be treated as the opposite gender. And they also experience the world with the feelings and reactions typical of the opposite gender. Essentially, their life experience is consistent with that of the other gender. Symptoms still must last for at least six months and must cause significant distress or impairment. In fact, gender dysphoria tends to cause substantial amounts of distress or impairment due to discrimination and rejection from others. Gender dysphoria typically begins early in childhood, particularly before the age of four. Although gender dysphoria occurs early on in life, the majority of children who experience symptoms and or the diagnosis do not continue to have this disorder into adulthood. However, 
When they do experience the disorder later on in life, it is often associated with social isolation and depression. This likely occurs because of the distress experienced by not being the right gender and the societal pressures and stigma placed on individuals who experience these symptoms. Typically during childhood, boys are more likely to be referred to treatment, likely because of greater acceptance for girls to do boy activities and not the other way around. Overall, gender dysphoria is more common among males. The etiology of gender dysphoria is not entirely understood, though it's thought to share overlap with the etiology of homosexuality in that it is at least partially biological in nature, but likely stems from a biological predisposition. In addition, Early research has suggested that higher levels of testosterone or estrogen during certain critical periods of development may masculinize a female fetus and feminize a male fetus. Although treatment is available for gender dysphoria in specialty clinics all over the world, it remains controversial. For children specifically, one treatment option is to decrease cross-gender behaviors and assert that these behaviors are unlikely to persist and negative consequences of social rejection could be avoided. Another approach is for parents or for other social supports of the child to seek help learning and implementing strategies to the child to affirm and identify with their current sex. However, there are various viewpoints regarding whether or not intervention should be sought in children or if society should be open to gender variations in children and adults. Treatment for adults is an extensive and expansive process. Unfortunately, traditional psychotherapy is typically not effective in reducing distress and or impairment in functioning given the biological barriers. However, one option is hormone replacement therapy. The aim of hormone therapy is to make individuals more comfortable with who they are, both in terms of physical appearance and how they feel. The hormones usually need to be taken for the rest of the client's life, even if they have gender surgery. In general, people wanting masculinization usually take testosterone and people after feminization usually take estrogen. Both usually have the additional effect of suppressing the release of unwanted hormones from the testes or ovaries. Whenever hormone therapy is used, it can take several months for hormone therapy to be effective, which can be frustrating. Lastly, sex reassignment surgery is used to permanently alter body parts associated with biological sex. So this can look like the removal of breasts or testes, or perhaps constructing these body parts. Unfortunately, Surgery is extremely expensive, and there are only a limited amount of doctors who do the surgery. Other criteria include needing to live as the other sex for at least one year, including hormones, and completing a comprehensive psychological assessment. Surgery is very complicated, and results are never perfect, so there is usually a need to get other surgeries to alter facial features. Ultimately, surgery can be a very empowering and life-changing procedure but it is extensive and can be both psychologically and physically distressing. Next, we'll discuss the paraphilias. Paraphilia means abnormal attraction. So these disorders all involve sexual attractions manifested by fantasies, urges, or behaviors to objects or behaviors considered abnormal in our society. The time duration for these disorders is six months. The paraphilias are an interesting set of disorders in that for some of them, the person can be given the diagnosis, even if they do not experience any distress or impairment. This contrasts with our definition of a mental illness that asserts that the behaviors must cause either distress or impairment. But in this case, some of these disorders substantially violate the rights of others, and so for that reason, the individual can be given the diagnosis, even if they do not personally experience any distress or impairment. As we discuss each of the paraphilias, I'll be sure to point out which ones necessitate distress or impairment and which ones don't. Some of the time, the diagnosis of paraphilias can be difficult because it can be hard to separate out normal sexual behavior and attraction from abnormal attraction. So one thing that tends to separate out some of these individuals is the exclusivity with which these objects or behaviors are needed for sexual arousal. People are not diagnosed with paraphilias just because they are sexually aroused by one of these objects or behaviors. It's instead usually that this might be the thing that principally, or perhaps exclusively, elicits sexual arousal. And that's why this can become problematic. However, it's also important to note that the diagnosis will occur if it violates the rights of others. With only a few exceptions, pretty much everyone with a paraphilia is a male. They tend to develop fairly early in life, typically in adolescence. When we discuss etiology, I'll come back to that and explain why that's the case. 
The paraphilias also have high comorbidity with one another. If you have one paraphilia, you have a higher chance of also being diagnosed with yet another paraphilia. Though we'll discuss treatment for the paraphilias, most people with these diagnoses do not seek out treatment. Typically, the only reason they engage in treatment is if they are mandated to treatment, such as if they've been caught engaging in their paraphilic behavior and may not now be mandated to sex offender treatment. You can see on this slide the list of the various paraphilias. We'll discuss each of them individually. The first paraphilia is fetishistic disorder. If you know what the term fetish means, you probably have a good sense of this disorder. It involves recurrent sexual arousal as manifested by fantasies, urges, or behaviors from the use of either non-living objects or a highly specific focus on non-genital body parts. So this is reflecting men who are highly sexually aroused and possibly only sexually aroused by the presence of non-sexual objects like cars or high heels. As I mentioned on the last slide, someone who is sexually aroused by certain types of feminine clothing like heels or lingerie or lace does not necessarily have a fetish. It's only when it causes distress or impairment in functioning, and this is typically linked with necessitating the presence of that object. For example, a man may have this disorder if he cannot become aroused unless he's simultaneously touching or holding a shoe, and that this is distressing to him or impairing in some way. For example, if he is in a relationship with a woman who is frustrated or offended that her boyfriend cannot become aroused and have sex with her, unless he's touching her shoes. This could cause some major impairment in their relationship. To go back to the non-genital body part feature, this is also to separate out guys who are very sexually aroused by sexual parts of the body, such as breasts. That's considered normal and wouldn't be diagnosed as a fetish. Instead, these would be men who are predominantly and possibly only aroused by non-sexual body parts, like feet. As with all the paraphilias, this arousal to non-living objects or non-sexual body parts must last at least six months. As I've been mentioning, it's likely that these men will require the presence of the fetish object in order to become aroused, which is what differentiates men with a fetish from typical men. But the specifics of its presence may vary. The man may need to do various things to it like touch it or smell it. Additionally, distress or impairment must be present for this diagnosis since having a fetish doesn't tend to violate the rights of others. The man may ask his partner to wear his fetish object, or he may require the object to be present, but that's not typically violating someone else's rights. The next paraphilia is transvestic disorder. In this case, the man has sexual arousal manifested by urges, fantasies, or behaviors involving cross-dressing. So this would be a man, typically who is heterosexual, who either frequently fantasizes about himself dressed as a woman, and this causes sexual arousal, or who may actually physically get dressed as a woman to achieve sexual arousal. Since this doesn't violate the rights of other people, the man must be distressed or impaired by this. For example, impairment might come about if his wife catches him dressing in her clothes and masturbating, which would disrupt their relationship. These urges or behaviors must have lasted for at least six months. Importantly, transvestic disorder is different from gay men who may dress in drag. Cross-dressing must produce sexual arousal and associated distress and impairment rather than enjoyment or interest in cross-dressing as seen in drag. Further, autogynophilia is a specifier for transvestic disorder that describes a pattern of sexual arousal associated not with the clothing itself, but rather with thoughts or images of oneself as a female. Individuals may focus on the idea of exhibiting female physiological functions, such, a, such as lactation or menstruation. They may engage in stereotypical feminine behavior, such as knitting, or want to possess female anatomy, such as breasts. The next paraphilia is voyeuristic disorder. In this case, the individual has sexual arousal manifested by urges, fantasies, or behaviors of observing unsuspecting individuals undressing or who are naked. Since it must be an unsuspecting victim who does not give consent, if the individual acts on the urges, this would be enough for a diagnosis. However, similar to other paraphilias, if the urges or fantasies are not acted upon, but do cause distress or impairment, that is also sufficient for a diagnosis. There's a documentary on Netflix called Voyeur, which unmasks a motel owner in Colorado who spied on his guests for decades and really highlights this disorder. Importantly, 
The person must be at least the age of 18 because adolescence and puberty generally demonstrate an increase in sexual curiosity and activity. So to alleviate risk of pathologizing normative sexual interest, the minimum age is 18. In addition, typically there must be at least three or more victims of voyeurism on separate occasions or multiple instances of an individual watching the same victim. Lastly, symptoms must be present for at least six months. Generally, men who engage in voyeuristic behavior will masturbate while they are watching the woman undress or having sex. He may also masturbate later while continuing to think about or fantasize about having watched the woman. This is the most common of the law-breaking paraphilias, and it is also likely to co-occur with exhibitionistic disorder, which we'll discuss next. The next paraphilia is exhibitionist disorder. In this case, the individual has sexual arousal manifested by urges, fantasies, or behaviors of exposing their genitals to unsuspecting strangers. Exhibitionism is in contrast to voyeurism, such that achieving sexual arousal and gratification comes from exposing themselves rather than watching. However, it is similar in that acting on these urges is violating the rights of others or the urges and fantasies can cause significant distress or impairment when not acted upon. In addition, typically there must be at least three or more victims of the exhibitionism on separate occasions or multiple instances of an individual exposing themselves to the same victim. Finally, symptoms must be present for at least six months. Within exhibitionistic disorder, the individual may actually misinterpret the shock in the victim as sexual arousal. Typically, the perpetrator is a male and the victims are often young or middle-aged females who do not know the offenders. Thus, the offenders actually seek out strangers as part of the thrill. This disorder commonly co-occurs with voyeuristic disorder, such that they get sexually aroused by watching others undress and by exposing themselves to strangers. For sexual sadism, the individual experiences sexual arousal manifested by fantasies, urges, or behaviors of producing psychological suffering in another person. They would meet this criteria for this disorder by having acted on this urge with a non-consenting person, since causing someone else to suffer is violating their rights, or by being distressed or impaired from their urges or fantasies. Again, symptoms must last for at least six months. Sexual sadism and sexual masochism, which we will talk about next, often are associated with themes related to dominance, control, and humiliation and becoming sexually aroused because of the violence and injury in these conditions. Sadists often inflict physical pain on their partner, including cutting with a razor, sticking with a needle, using whips and chains, biting various parts of their body, using bondage, engaging in verbal abuse, and engaging in oxygen deprivation by strangling or smothering, among many other injurious behaviors in order to become sexually aroused and achieve orgasm. It is estimated that about 5 to 15% of men and women report enjoying sadistic and or masochistic activities voluntary on some occasion. However, in order for it to become a psychological diagnosis, it must include a non-consenting person or distress. Sexual masochism is the opposite of sexual sadism. So while sadism involves sexual arousal from making others suffer, Sexual masochism involves sexual arousal from being made to suffer oneself. Again, this tends to include themes of humiliation and domination, but in this case, the person's receiving it is the one who's experiencing sexual arousal. Since this behavior does not violate the rights of others, since the person being made to suffer is consenting, the diagnosis must involve the experience of distress or impairment. As usual, the time duration must be at least six months. Sexual masochism is more common than sadism and is seen in both males and females. Importantly, sadomasochism occurs when individuals enjoy switching roles and they get aroused from both inflicting and experiencing pain. Although this is less common, it is seen in both males and females as well. Our next paraphilia is pedophilia. Before I discuss the criteria, I want to point out that the psychiatric criteria for pedophilia is different from the legal definition. The legal definition varies by state and may or may not overlap with the DSM criteria. So for the psychiatric diagnosis of pedophilic disorder, the person must experience sexual arousal as manifested by fantasies, urges, or behavior from sexual activity with a prepubescent child, 
generally one who is 13 years or younger. Since acting on these urges would violate the rights of the child, simply doing so is sufficient for the diagnosis. Otherwise, if the individual has never acted on the urges but only fantasizes about it, he must experience distress or impairment. While the child should typically be 13 or younger, the pedophile must be at least age 16 and also at least five years older than the child. Thus, a 14-year-old having sex with a 12-year-old would not meet this criteria, nor would a 16-year-old having sex with a 13-year-old. There must be the five-year difference and the perpetrator must be at least 16. Again, symptoms must last for at least six months. Although the exact cause is unknown for pedophilia, there is some evidence to suggest that pedophiles are more likely to have been sexually or physically abused as children. In addition, two-thirds of the victims are female and one-third are relatives of the offender. Thus, pedophilia can take the form of incest in which deviant sexual attraction is directed towards a family member, and this is often the attraction of a father toward a daughter who is maturing physically. One study found that approximately 90% of abusers are male. There are also two types of pedophilia, including situational and preference. The situational type is primarily adults who are in relationships, but engage in abuse during an opportunity that arises. He or she enjoys having sex with adults, but have sex with children when the opportunity arises. For example, maybe they are left alone with a child, they're drunk, they're angry at the child or maybe even the mother, and assault the child to hurt the mother. Typically, this is associated with a significant amount of distress following the event. The preference type includes individuals who have no interest in having sex with adults, only children, and usually prepubescent. These are generally male and have a distinct pattern to their predatory behavior, including recruiting victims, referred to as grooming, and retaining them in an ongoing pattern of sexual abuse while ensuring that they do not disclose the abuse. These types of offenders are not distressed with their behavior and see nothing wrong with it. The last paraphilia is frauderistic disorder. In this case, men achieve sexual arousal as manifested by urges, fantasies, or behaviors from touching or rubbing their penis against an unsuspecting and non-consenting person. So these would be guys who press themselves up against unsuspecting women in a crowded place and unbeknownst to the women, rub against her until he becomes aroused or ejaculates. Clearly, this violates the rights of these women. So acting on this urge is sufficient for the diagnosis. If the man only fantasizes about it, but doesn't act on it, he must experience distress or impairment. And again, the time duration is six months. These men will actively seek out crowded places, like crowded public transportation, such as subways or buses at rush hour, or crowded concert venues. Depending on how long the crowd lasts and how long it takes the man to orgasm, he may continue rubbing himself against the woman until he does ejaculate. But if he's forced out of the setting sooner than that, he'll usually quickly leave to masturbate, similar to an exhibitionistic disorder. The man may fantasize that he is in a relationship with a woman, though it's highly likely that the woman will have never even known what was happening, since it was crowded and she likely had several people pressed up against her. Paraphilias are largely classically conditioned and tend to begin in adolescence. More than anything, because that's a time when boys' sex drive is pretty high, making it easy for them to form sexual associations. For the most part, it's thought that initially adolescent boys just happen to be masturbating, which naturally produces arousal or orgasm. So masturbation is the US, while arousal or orgasm is the UR. While the boy is masturbating, some paraphilic object or stimulus just happens to be present. In this example on this slide, I have a pair of high heels. So the high heels are the CS and come to signal that masturbation is coming. So then the high heels all on their own can produce arousal, which is the CR. This would explain how someone could have developed a shoe fetish. In terms of treatment, there are some medication options available that work to reduce sexual desire, specifically SSRIs. One of the major side effects of SSRIs is reduced sex drive, so they can be used as treatment for paraphilias. Additionally, men can be prescribed Depo-Provera. Probably many of the women in this class will recognize that as a birth control method. It is given as a shot and is long acting. It works to decrease testosterone levels in this case. The problems with these methods are that they are short-term solutions and not even necessarily great solutions at that. 
they don't actually eliminate the man's ability to become aroused or masturbate or to have sex. It just reduces sex drive. Additionally, there's a huge issue with noncompliance. So unless they're being court ordered to take this medication, there's nothing really stopping them from, from discontinuing use. And after they stop using these medications, their sex drive and testosterone levels will return to normal. So these medications are best used on a temporary basis while also administering psychological treatments, which will be a more long-term solution. Treatment for paraphilias also work off of classical conditioning procedures. The first option is aversion therapy, where the man would be asked to masturbate to his paraphilic object and then would receive some punishment while doing so, such as being shocked or being exposed to some noxious or foul odor. Therefore, the paraphilic stimulus becomes classically conditioned to be associated with something bad, rather than sexual pleasure. Specifically, the paraphilic stimulus is a CS, which is paired with a bad smell, the US, which automatically makes you feel sick, which is the UR. Eventually, seeing the paraphilic stimulus is associated with feeling sick. The next possibility is covert sensitization. In this treatment, the man is instructed to vividly imagine engaging in his paraphilic act, such as exposing his genitals to women. He would then imagine in detail the negative consequences of being caught doing this behavior, such as having all of his friends and family find out about his paraphilia and imagining all of the shame and embarrassment that he would feel from this. Importantly, imagining the negative emotions like shame and guilt are necessary part of this treatment. It's not just that the person imagines getting caught, but they need to emotionally experience the repercussions, which would deter them from wanting to engage in that behavior in the future. Finally, orgasmic reconditioning is a possibility. Here, the man would be instructed to masturbate to his paraphilic stimulus, and right before he's about to orgasm, the paraphilic stimulus is replaced by a more appropriate stimulus. For instance, a picture of the man's wife. Therefore, an appropriate sexual stimulus becomes paired with masturbation so that the man will associate an appropriate stimulus with sexual behavior rather than his paraphilic stimulus. We'll finish up this lecture by talking about the sexual dysfunctions. There are seven disorders that fall into one of four categories. Problems with desire, arousal, orgasm, or pain. Occasional problems in these areas that are not persistent or recurrent or are not accompanied by marked distress or interpersonal difficulty are not considered to be sexual dysfunctions. So for the diagnosis, these difficulties must be recurrent or persistent and must cause distress or impairment. Most of the sexual dysfunctions map onto one of the phases in the typical sexual response cycle. When we prepare to have sex, first we need to experience desire to do so which can include fantasies or just the desire or want to engage in sexual activity. People who have difficulties in this phase lack thoughts about having sex or desire to do so. We'll discuss two disorders that are relevant to this stage. The person cannot progress in the sexual response cycle because they do not have desire for sex. After desire, when we first start engaging in sexual activity, we enter the excitement phase, which includes pleasurable feelings and physiological changes. In men, this will include penile swelling and becoming engorged, with blood to produce an erection. And for women, it will include vaginal lubrication. So dysfunctions in this phase will include difficulties becoming physiologically aroused, despite wanting to become aroused. We'll discuss one disorder in this stage. The third state is orgasm, which is the peak of sexual pleasure associated with ejaculation for men and contractions of the pelvic muscles for women. Obviously, problems in this phase include difficulties with orgasm. We'll discuss three disorders relevant to this stage. The last phase is resolution, which follows orgasm and where people feel good and relaxed. During this phase, men experience a refractory period where they cannot progress through the cycle again for a variable amount of time, on average, about 30 minutes. Women do not experience a refractory period. This is the only phase of the sexual response cycle that, that does not include sexual dysfunctions. So as we go through the seven sexual dysfunctions, we'll go through them in order of the sexual response cycle, but ending with a pain disorder, which is the only one that doesn't map onto a specific phase of the cycle. Male hypoactive sexual desire disorder is a dysfunction in desire in men. Hypoactive means reduced or too little. 
So this disorder includes persistent or recurrent absence of desire, meaning that the man doesn't think about sex or fantasize about sex or want to have sex. Note that this judgment of this deficiency or absence must include a consideration of contextual factors like age and life context. For example, an eight-year-old boy could say he doesn't fantasize ever about having sex, but we would never say he has this disorder. Desiring sex is not developmentally appropriate for that age. Or a 75-year-old man whose wife has passed away might say that he has no thoughts about or desire for sex. The clinician might judge that this is to be expected given the man's age and life circumstances and wouldn't warrant the diagnosis. This lack of desire must be prolonged, lasting for at least six months, and importantly, it must cause significant distress. This criterion of distress will separate out someone with this disorder from someone with, for instance, schizoid personality disorder. Recall that in, that in schizoid personality disorder, the individual does not wish to engage in any type of relationship with others, including sexual relationships. So the person has absolutely no desire for sex, but he's happy that way. That doesn't cause him distress. For people with male hypoactive sexual desire disorder, this lack of desire is troublesome, perhaps because this lack of desire is interfering with the man's ability to maintain a romantic relationship. The other sexual desire disorder is female sexual interest or arousal disorder, which is basically the equivalent of male hypoactive sexual desire disorder, but in women. For this diagnosis, the woman needs to experience the absence of or significantly reduce sexual interest or arousal as indicated by at least three of six symptoms. First, there might just be a report that the woman is not experiencing any interest in having sex. Or she might report that she never fantasizes about sex or thinks about sex. Next, the woman might report that because she never desires sex, she never attempts to initiate sex with her partner. And even when her partner attempts to initiate sex with her, she will likely resist those attempts and turn down sex. If the woman does actually engage in sexual activity, she might report that she doesn't experience excitement or pleasure. This is because according to the sexual response cycle, in order to ultimately achieve pleasure from sex, you have to first have desire for sex, which she is lacking. The woman might also report an absence of arousal in response to both internal and external sexual cues. What this means is that if she does think about sex or when she views some external stimulus related to sex, such as pornography, she still does not become sexually aroused. Finally, again, if she does have sex, she may report that she does not experience vaginal lubrication or orgasm during sex. Again, because she's not progressing through the desire phase, so she can't achieve any further stages. These symptoms must last for at least six months and cause the woman distress. Note that this disorder is functionally the same as the one we just discussed, just differed by gender. However, what do you notice about the criteria? Hopefully you've picked up on the fact that women need to experience many more specific symptoms than do men for this disorder. This is likely due to societal expectations and norms. It's expected in our society for men to have much more desire for sex than women. So if it is all lacking in men, it's abnormal. For women, it's more expected that their sexual desire may be lower. And so for it to be disordered, the woman needs to experience and demonstrate this lack of desire in multiple ways. The only sexual excitement disorder is erectile disorder. You are probably familiar with this disorder, which is otherwise known as erectile dysfunction. This disorder is clearly only present in men and is diagnosed when the man experiences at least one of the following three symptoms on nearly all occasions of sexual activity. Either not being able to obtain an erection at all, or that the man can obtain an erection but cannot maintain it, meaning that it goes away before completion of the sexual activity, or that there is a decrease in erectile rigidity, meaning that the man can obtain an erection, but it is not rigid enough to complete sexual activity. Again, symptoms must last for at least six months and cause the man distress. This is the most common sexual dysfunction reported by men age 60 and over. The first orgasmic disorder is delayed ejaculation. In this case, on nearly all occasions of partnered sexual activity, the man experiences either a prolonged delay in ejaculation or the complete inability to ejaculate. Importantly, this delay or absence of ejaculation or orgasm occurs without the man wishing for it. So delayed ejaculation tends to occur when the man is engaging in prolonged thrusting to the point of exhaustion or genital discomfort, and then finally having to cease efforts to ejaculate. 
These symptoms must again be present for at least six months and cause distress to the man. The next orgasmic disorder is the opposite, premature ejaculation. In this case, the man experiences recurrent ejaculation during nearly all instances of partnered sexual activity that occurs within approximately one minute following vaginal penetration, and importantly, before the man wishes to ejaculate. It's really that last piece that's important. If neither the man nor the woman is concerned or upset that the man ejaculates quickly, it's not a psychological diagnosis. So it's only a disorder when the man is ejaculating quickly despite trying and wanting not to. Though the criterion states that ejaculation occurs within approximately one minute, this is just sort of a benchmark to use and not necessarily a hard and fast rule. For example, a man could be ejaculating within two minutes despite not wanting to, and if this causes him extreme distress, he could still be given the diagnosis. This is sort of a subjective piece of the criteria. Surveys on sexual behavior indicate that the average man takes about seven minutes following penetration to ejaculate, compared with one or two minutes for men with premature ejaculation. As mentioned, these symptoms must cause distress, and importantly, they must last for at least six months and occur on nearly all occasions of sexual activity. This is really important to keep in mind, as some men may ejaculate quickly due to a new partner or particular excitement on a few occasions. For this behavior to be disordered, it must be recurrent and prolonged in nature. The last orgasmic disorder occurs in women, and it's female orgasmic disorder. In this case, a woman experiences one or both of the following symptoms on nearly all occasions of sexual activity, either a delay in or absence of orgasm, or if she does reach orgasm, the intensity or sensations are significantly reduced. The concept of normal and abnormal orgasms has been recently debated. A female's ability to achieve orgasm is highly variable. For instance, only 20% can reliably achieve orgasm through intercourse alone, 8% never achieve orgasm, and some women can only achieve orgasm through masturbation, but not with their partner unless it is oral sex. Regardless, these symptoms must be present for at least six months and cause distress. Finally, the last sexual dysfunction is genital pelvic pain or penetration disorder. This disorder is only diagnosed in women. She must report at least one of four persistent or reoccurring difficulties. First, she may report difficulty with penetration during intercourse and that penetration attempts are unsuccessful. This could be due to pain or lack of vaginal lubrication. Remember that female sexual interest or arousal disorder can also include this type of symptom, but in that case, it's due to lack of sexual desire. In this case, there is sexual desire, but pain or fear of pain is interfering with successful intercourse. Or the woman might experience successful penetration, but report repeated pain during sex or during penetration. Another symptom is that she might report fear or anxiety about experiencing pain during sex that likely prevents her from attempting sex or being successful in penetration attempts. Finally, she might report the experience of tensing or tightening of her pelvic floor muscles during attempted vaginal penetration that results in the sensation of vaginal spasms that are usually reported to be uncomfortable, if not painful. These symptoms must last for at least six months and cause the woman distress. Typically, when a woman has this disorder, though the criteria are with regard to sexual intercourse, these symptoms tend to generalize to any penetration attempts, including inserting a tampon or undergoing any type of gynecology exam. There are a variety of things that can contribute to sexual dysfunction. Medical conditions like diabetes, kidney disease, vascular diseases, heart problems, or chronic illness may contribute to sexual dysfunctions for a variety of reasons such as reducing sensitivity in the genital area, restricting blood flow to the genitals, or creating worry about physical exertion, which results in sexual dysfunction. Medications such as beta blockers for hypertension reduce the amount of blood supply to the genitals, which can cause erectile difficulties. And SSRIs, which you should realize by now are frequently prescribed for a variety of conditions, can result in decreased sexual arousal. As people age, their sex hormones decrease. So sexual dysfunctions may result from men having too little testosterone or women having too little estrogen. I want to be very clear that it tends to be increased age that is associated with sexual dysfunctions, not young age. For example, young age, which is related to inexperience, 
would not be determined to be a causal factor for premature ejaculation. Additionally, Chronic alcohol, cocaine, and heroin abuse suppresses sexual arousal. People may also experience sexual dysfunctions if they are chronically depressed or anxious. Performance anxiety can also influence sexual dysfunctions, but remember that these disorders are only diagnosed when they're reoccurrent and persistent. So if performance anxiety is the cause, it must be chronic. Additionally, sexual desire and ability may be diminished if the person has chronic relationship problems. There are a variety of treatments for the sexual dysfunctions. In terms of medication, you are all probably familiar with medication to treat erectile disorder, since they play commercials for them on TV all of the time. Medications like Viagra or Cialis are commonly prescribed to promote erections in people with erectile disorder. However, they do not increase sexual desire or satisfaction, so they are only effective if the only problem is that the man cannot attain or maintain his erection. These medications can have some unwanted side effects, such as severe headaches, so men may choose some other biological treatment methods for helping with erectile dysfunction. Men can insert a soft capsule into their urethra or get an injection into their penis, which will dilate the blood vessels to help achieve an erection. Clearly, both of those methods are likely pretty painful. Men may also get penile implants where either a semi-rigid silicone rod is implanted into the penis that can be bent by the man to put into the correct position when he wants to have sex and moved out of the way at other times, or a man can have a small pump surgically implanted into a scrotum, which will force fluid into an inflatable cylinder in the penis, producing an erection when he pumps it. Directed masturbation exercises would be recommended for a variety of disorders. People are told to practice effective masturbation so that they can learn how to achieve orgasm quickly and can then teach their partner, or so that they can become more relaxed while being sexually aroused and then eventually pair that with sex. In Sensate Focus, the couple is initially instructed to completely ban sex. This takes away any anxiety about performing and takes the focus off of sex and intercourse. Instead, they're instructed to touch and massage each other at first in non-sexual areas to become more relaxed and focus on pleasure. And then they will guide their partner's hands to different areas of their body and use verbal communication to tell their partner what feels good. Eventually, sex is reintroduced gradually once the partners are relaxed and once each other's needs and wants and likes have been communicated. Sensei focus could also be used in treatment of a variety of dysfunctions. The pause and squeeze technique is used for premature ejaculation. When the man feels that he is about to ejaculate following penetration, he pulls out and either he or his partner squeezes the head of his penis until the urge to ejaculate subsides. Then, they resume sex again until the man feels that he is about to ejaculate. Again, he pulls out and they squeeze the head of the penis. They continue doing this until the man wishes to orgasm. This will eventually help the man go for longer periods of time without ejaculating, as his body is being trained to withhold ejaculation for some period of time. The last treatment is specifically for the treatment of genital pelvic pain or penetration disorder. Women are given a very small dilator to practice self-inserting into their vagina while also practicing relaxation exercises. It's thought that pain or muscle spasms are due to excessive anxiety, so this gives the woman practice relaxing while starting with a very small penetration. Once she can do that successfully, she will practice with a slightly larger dilator. She will keep doing this and increasing the size of the dilator until she can successfully use a dilator about the size of a penis without experiencing vaginal contractions. The remainder of the slides include the what's the disorder activity. Please let me know if you have any questions or would like to check your answers. Here's the first one. Trisha has experienced severe pain during sex for the past several years. It feels as though the muscles in her vagina spasm and tighten up upon penetration, causing so much pain that she needs to stop. Trisha is afraid that she will never be able to have a lasting relationship because of this. Shelly is a five-year-old girl. She frequently states that she wants to be a boy and tends to play only with other boys. She likes to play pretend games such as cowboys and Indians and plays with army dolls rather than Barbie dolls. She screams whenever her mother tries to dress her in dresses or skirts and will only wear pants. Shelly asserts that she will one day grow a penis and become a boy. These behaviors have lasted for the last year and result in Shelly getting bullied and made fun of at school. During the past two years, every weekend Ernie chooses an unsuspecting teenage girl 
who is walking alone outside and jumps out at her from behind a doorway, tree, or car parked on the sidewalk. When he jumps out, he exposes his penis to her. He flees the scene afterwards and masturbates when he is alone. Ernie is not at all distressed by this behavior. Bruce frequently rides crowded subways where he becomes sexually stimulated by rubbing up against unsuspecting women. He engages in this behavior several times per day and is often able to take advantage of women without their comprehending what he is doing. Bruce is not distressed by this. Jeremy feels that he is unable to control his orgasms. He is married and typically has sex with his wife once per week. Following penetration, Jeremy typically has an orgasm within the next minute. Jeremy is worried because he believes that his wife is upset because sex typically ends before his wife is able to have an orgasm. Brian is 55 years old. He has been happily married for many years, but has recently found that he is unable to achieve an erection as easily as he used to. He can often achieve an erection during masturbation, but during sex, he often cannot achieve one at all. This has been happening for the past six months, and Brian is significantly distressed by this. For several years, Walt has been unable to become sexually aroused unless he has access to lace underwear. Every day, he masturbates while caressing a pair of women's lace underwear. He has tried to masturbate without the underwear, but he cannot become aroused. When he has sex with a woman, he insists that she wear lace. Walt is not distressed about this behavior, but it has interfered with his ability to maintain relationships with women. Over the last year, Kirk has recurrent fantasies about engaging in sexual acts with young girls. He often thinks about his eight-year-old stepdaughter and has envisioned himself going into her room at night to touch her. He has never acted on these urges, though Kirk is distressed by them and is afraid that he will give in to his urges one day and ruin his marriage. Betty and her husband, Barney, often engage in role play during sex. Over the past year, they have frequently engaged in role play where Barney is a stranger who rapes Betty. Barney will verbally abuse Betty, tie her up, and slap her. Betty used to enjoy these role plays, but they have become a little too physically violent for her. She told Barney that she didn't want to do this anymore, but Barney continues to engage in this behavior. She frequently attempts to avoid sex now. After giving birth, Carol says that she has no time or energy for sex with her husband. In fact, they have not been sexually intimate for eight months. Carol never thinks about sex, and when her husband mentions it, she always says that she's not in the mood. Carol can't imagine ever being sexual again. On the very few times when she has given into her husband's attempts to engage in sexual activity, she is unable to become sufficiently lubricated and does not experience any pleasure during sex. She is saddened by the effect that this change has had on her marriage, as she believes her husband may now be having an affair, but feels little motivation to try to change. When Meg became sexually active in college, she felt that she was probably missing something, since she did not feel rockets going off as she had imagined. She did not experience an orgasm during her first sexual encounter, nor during any of her other sexual experiences in college. When she fell in love with a man after college, she hoped things would be different. However, Meg still has not had an orgasm during sex. Both Meg and her fiancé are upset by this. In the evenings after his wife leaves for work, Phil goes into his basement to retrieve his hidden stash of women's clothes, including underwear, stockings, high heels, makeup, a wig, and dresses. Phil dresses in these clothes and fantasizes that he's being pursued by several men. Though he limits this behavior to the evenings, he frequently thinks about it during the day, which interferes with his job. Phil does not have any desire to leave his wife and does not consider himself homosexual. However, this fantasy of is highly arousing, even more so than watching his wife undress. Edward lives in a dorm on campus. On most evenings, he sneaks around in the bushes, looking for a good vantage point from which to gaze into the windows of female students. Using binoculars, he's able to find at least one room in which a woman is undressing. Edward will masturbate while engaging in this behavior. Over the last six months, Gary has noticed that it has become much more difficult and takes much longer for him to have an orgasm. He has been married for 20 years, but still asserts that he's attracted to his wife. Whenever they have sex now, it is usual that he will not even experience an orgasm as he and his wife will typically end their sexual activity after about 30 minutes. A few weeks ago, he was able to ejaculate after about 45 minutes after initiating sex, but his wife is usually too tired to maintain sexual activity for that long. This is severely distressing for Gary. Sebastian is a 35 year old male. He is married and loves his wife, but reports that he does not have any desire to engage in sexual activity. He never fantasizes about sex, 
and frequently pretends to be sleeping or not feeling well if his wife wants to have sex. This is distressing to Sebastian as he knows that it is interfering with his marriage.